I was very intrigued by the uh, survey that went up earlier on about um, optimism or pessimism about marketing. I've actually never understood marketing, what it really means, even today. I, I've never been a CMO before, and I still don't really know what being a CMO really means. I think it means something very, very different, depending upon which organization you're a part of. I certainly know in the case of Acer, it's very much about transformation. How are we going to be relevant going forward? Um, and what's our process to get there? I've never also been much about process. It's, I've always been an, on the agency side of the business, tended to feel that research doesn't tend to lead to creativity and try to eschew the whole idea of it. I've had to really change um, my spots considerably over the last 18 months to try and figure out what it is that we need to be. What I can say is, um, to be reflective of, of Mark's uh, presentation, is purpose is absolutely what we're looking for. And whether we defined it as what searching for purpose or objective or whatever the word, we are absolutely in our own way looking for exactly that. I, I feel that our way of getting there has to be very different from a Unilever, but nonetheless, that is absolutely what we're trying to do. I didn't really know how to approach the idea of how do we move beyond the PC. I, I'm not even an IT person by background. And you think about it, I'm not sure how I'm qualified to do this job. So, um, uh, but nonetheless, I suppose I'm a change agent and I'm somebody who's, I suppose, you know, spent most of my years at Interbrand not knowing whether we we're going to ever pay the bills, but somehow coming up with some concepts that ended up being interesting and broadening the world of marketing in their own little way. And that, I suppose that's sort of the history that I'm picking on. But I said to uh, Red Peak, who's one of our agencies, look, clearly what we have to do is focus on what we're all calling Generation Y or the Millennials or whatever you want to call them. Um, and, but please give me something that's actionable. I can't, I can't be doing with all this information about them, and I'll go into that in a minute. You know, come, let's come up with something that I can actually pin it on, because unless I can get our organization really believing actionable, what we can do with actual insight, really my opinion isn't going to count for anything. It, it isn't going to get us where we need to be. I should also say, before getting into it, that we're actually going to be announcing in great detail at Computex in Taipei at the beginning of June what we are going to be doing. Sadly, I can't really reveal too much about that today, but I can at least show you some of the thought processes that we've been going through, which is very much driven by an understanding of what millennial really means. And I hope some of those insights might be useful for you in your roles um, in, in, your, in your job. So anyway, so let's just get into it. So, so who are millennials? Basically, just to define Generation Y, anybody born between the 1980s and the early 2000s. Um, and they're very important. Um, by 2018, they'll have the most spending power of any generation that's ever existed. Um, and next year alone, they'll have depending on who you speak to, an enormous spending power, $2.5 trillion, trillion. Also in the workplace, I mean, by 2025, three out of every four workers globally will what we currently call millennials. By anybody's definition, they are pretty much the market that you're going to be focusing on really from here on in. It's also, as I mentioned, one of the most talked about generations of all time. This is part of my concern. I was reading so much all the time, and so much of it is actually conflicting. So you get a lot of very positive things written and a lot of very negative things written. So you know, how, you know, how, how can we actually try to understand who millennials really are and what can we do with that particular piece of information? Most of what you do read tends to be negative. Um, people, you know, a, lot, a lot of very sort of negative adjectives, lazy, uh, purposeless, and so on. But when you actually look at it, there's really not, there's a lot that is not different. I mean, this is a quote from uh, the 8th century BC. When I was a boy, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but the present youth are exceedingly unwise and impatient of restraint by Hesiod. I mean, I think every generation probably has the exact same perception on the generation coming through that there is on this particular one. So nothing new there. It's also clearly not homogenous. Um, there's no you know, you, you see happy and, uh, and smiling faces of, of, of multi-ethnic groups. You see very despondent groups and, and photographs. But at the end of the day, 
again, part of the issue was categorization, really very, very difficult. One of the early insights that we got in doing this particular work through this study was to try and let's just drop the name millennial and generation Y if we can, because it is so undefined, it's so difficult to sort of build any strategy on the, on the back of it. So how, what can we actually do to create a, 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 a rallying call, something that we can actually get a transformation behind? What do these 2.5 billion people have in common? So we start, peel it back, you know, let's just start at the very beginning. What, what do we actually understand by the notion of generation? Um, this is one definition by the guy who invented the French dictionary, a pretty obvious point. Perhaps a more interesting one is Karl Mannheim's, only groups that live through rapid social change can be called the generation. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's certainly interesting and certainly, I think, very applicable to what we're actually dealing with now. And when you look at, at the China and the US, you can actually certainly define much of what's happened in the last 100 years with, in, the, in China's case, four generations, in the US, three. Um, the traditionalists in the, in the fight for China during the, the rise of, of communism. The lost generation, which was essentially um, the time going through the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Generation X, which is when things started opening up and the little emperor's generation. And equally in the US, as I said, in, in maybe in, in three particular generations, the lost generation between the wars, the greatest generation that won the, the Second World War, and then the baby boomers, which of course, um, have, as itself, got a lot of press. But huge shifts is what changes generations. But, you know, this was essentially, actually the guy just died, I think, two weeks ago in this particular photograph. But anyway, this was you know, the famous kiss just after the uh, VE Day in 1945. Um, for certain generations, certainly as I was growing up, uh, Man on the Moon, big moment, fall of the Berlin Wall. This connotes immediately um, one sense of what a particular generation was all about. But when you look at millennials, it's not surprising that actually they are perhaps confused and to some degree unconfident about the world because not only um, has the world you know, changed dramatically from essentially, certainly from a, uh, from a Cold War per perception, but everything is a little complicated, whether it's the war on terror that was really launched at 9-11 the whole financial crisis, which I think has given this generation a very, very different attitude to money. And it's very interesting talking to banks specifically about the conservatism that Generation Y has about money in the way that the previous generation did not. And also um, climate change. I mean, these are three, these are three massive issues that, that this generation is dealing with, and none of them are straightforward. It's not goodies versus baddies. It's basically how not only understanding what it is, but actually understanding what we do about it. It is absolutely anything but straightforward. So how is this impacting them psychologically? So we did this survey of 1,000 people, and it wasn't just a sort of um, a correspondence. It was actually interviewing people in great depth. And I think that the common theme that, that came through this work and the thing that actually helped us define what it is, how we start figuring out a strategy that is based upon generation Y, was this particular point. Did you have access to the internet before the age of 18? That may seem pretty obvious to us all here today, but it was quite interesting how it was the absolutely consistent theme in terms of the responses that we were getting and the different attitudes. Basically, you just cannot, you cannot understate the impact of the way that people look at life when essentially they've always known the internet. They've never known a world without it. And for those of us who have actually adapted our lives to it, it's a fundamental point. And so essentially this was the, the, current, the theme that we used to actually come up with our definition at ASA of what we are gonna call Generation Y and the Millennials, which is basically the connected generation. That is actually for us, not just because we're an IT firm, I think it's a very interesting point anyway, but at the end of the day, the connected generation is the consistent theme around which we are about to rebuild our company. I think that there's some insights that also I think I'd like to share with you that, that came out of the work. The connected generation defines their identity very differently from the general population, and frankly, in my opinion, very differently from generations before. 
some of the words that, that you, you get when, when people, when, when the generation Y or the connected generation talks about itself, good looking, creative, stylish, successful, bold and funny, very, very positive sort of creative attributes. Whereas if, if you speak to older generations, you tend to get more homely values, team player, good friend, independent, dependable. So it's clearly, it's very interesting. We, we wanted to delve further back to what, why would the dawn of the internet influence somebody to have the values that you see on the right-hand side of the chart rather than the ones on the left? What, what, why is that? I think one of the reasons is because of the very nature in which people communicate. Again, it's a pretty obvious point. You've heard it countless times. But basically, the connected generation grew up in a time when communication was fundamentally changed forever. It basically largely went away from face-to-face, -face, although we all like to think it's still very, very important. But the reality is, and again, you've seen these charts countless times, different ways. But at the end of the day, the ability to broadcast your life, the ability to actually have your say without somebody having their say back, at least to your face, is a very, very different way of communicating. Obvious point, but nonetheless very profound. Another insight was it's not just a question of the fact that it's a different way of being able to broadcast and communicate, but it requires a lot more premeditation. This may be instinctive to people now. It certainly wasn't 15 years ago before we understood the power of email and the importance of email, and perhaps, frankly, for some of us, the fact that you can't delete what it is that you write on email. But the reality is that you do have to think in a different way. It's hard to write something down and then take it back again. People try, but it's not easy. And that does change the way that people communicate. And even if people don't realize it, they are actually thinking maybe at warp speed compared to perhaps the communicators 20, 30 years ago. But actually, it, taking that little bit of extra care, knowing how important it is, because you're writing it down, does make a very, very big difference. So it's basically, whether it's being conscious or subconscious, every single time somebody from this generation is communicating, they're crafting their persona in a way that I just don't think it was the same uh, in the, in the pre-internet era. And of course, sometimes it, it really is profoundly irritating. I mean, it's, it's quite funny when you actually see just how people can get very put off by the fact that, you know, what people tweet, what people put on Facebook. But I mean, you know, we, we found that a lot of attitudes coming back were how irritated people were from this survey in terms of, um, you know, what people write and how much it puts them off people. I mean, this is one example. I don't know how single people do it. I'm engaged and my friends has been away and I miss him so much. I mean, you know, nice one. And then, um, <laughs> I like this one too. I just arrived in Barbados, sorry to all my peeps left in the snow. I mean, the, and the, there's just countless ones. But even, the, even if fame seekers are a minority though, again, the, the important point is how important it is in the crafting of people's persona. In, um, and so, you know, 74% of the people agree that it's important for people to understand me rather than 62% of the general population. And even in other parts of the world, even though this study was largely US-based, um, we did take it around the world. And again, you can read these percentages. Um, but the importance of social media conveying a certain image felt by this generation to be unbelievably important. This is interesting. Again, this may seem obvious, but it's interesting nonetheless. Because anything can be uploaded all the time, that always looking your best is actually unbelievably important to people. It's, when you see human beings today, it's true, whether you're watching them on sports fields, whether you're watching them in bars, they have a very, very different way of of being simply because they never know when all of a sudden somebody's going to take a photo, it's going to get uploaded. And it, again, it's part of this crafting of persona and part of a very different way of looking. And it starts to inform why when people want to look at themselves as stylish and bold and creative as opposed to sort of good natured and team player, it sort of all makes sense. I've gone somewhere or done something based on how cool it would sound to my social network. It's interesting. Um, and this is also another interesting one, how bad people feel when they do put a post down and nobody likes it. They suddenly feel like they're the loser. That is a very interesting insight as to how that's going to take social media going forward. That's another conversation. I'll have it with you over a drink later on maybe. But, but it's actually, I think, insightful for the way that the market's actually going to go. 
And it's all happened so unbelievably fast. I mean, look at, look at selfie. I mean, I mean, this has sort of come up, you know, it's, it's just been put in the Oxford Dictionary as a word for the first time in the last few months. And now you've got everybody doing it. This was sort of, you know, the Oscars moment. Then you've got, you know, Barack Obama. I love Michelle Obama's face on this one, by the way. So it's absolutely classic. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. And the Pope's even getting in on the act. But, um, um, but it's, again, something that we didn't even talk about very much. I mean, yes, I know we did it a little bit a year or so ago, but it's, it's happened so, so quickly. Um, but not everybody's narcissistic over all of this. I mean, again, when you look at how a question we asked about how ex-friends would, would, um, would look at you, this connected generation were quite honest about the situation, that they would admit that you know, they've got certain negative traits like being lazy or a pushover or timid. Whereas I think that the older generation, again, isn't at the extreme so much. They're both around the medium point, so a kind, good listener, dependable. I, I, that made me wishful thinking, actually. If you talk about ex-friends, I don't know, but anyway, whatever. But it, 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 the point being that, again, there's, there's a curious um, extreme in, in, in the um, and self-consciousness that you, um, you get with this particular generation, very self-aware. Here's some other interesting points that we found. 46% admit to talking to their cell phone with no one on the other end of the line <laughs> to avoid a confrontation. Um, 80, this is a good one. 80% of millennials find it acceptable to lie to avoid embarrassment compared to 57% of baby boomers. Interesting. And then conflict averse. This is actually another very, very, again, hardly surprising when you think about it because if you're growing up in this world where you can broadcast yourself and you, you do it, a lot of your communications by text, the, you actually can avoid conflict by text and by, by the written word. And therefore, the idea of breaking up with somebody in this particular case, um, rather than doing it face to face, which is perhaps not the way I was brought up, but nonetheless, it seems to be the way a lot of people do it now, um, is again, in interesting. Again, we all know this one, but again, 58% would rather email somebody than call. Um, and again, anybody who, you know, whatever age you are, but and I have kids who are in this particular generation, but I, I know that it's pointless trying to call them. Texting is always the way to get. And then, you know, 26% of them are too bashful to ask for a doggy bag. The, you know, at the end of the day, it's not, not the image that they want to have. 67 report that they have never clicked on a sponsor's story. They don't trust advertising. I don't really think that's a terribly meaningful statement. I think if you asked any generation ever since adver advertising was born, they'd all, they'd all admit or they'd try and say that they don't like advertising. I don't think that is particularly insightful. But the one beneath it is unbelievably insightful, that 98% are more likely to engage with a friend's post over a brand's post. Again. We've all, I'm sure, been working with the importance of peer reviews and the importance of, of, of the new word of mouth. But it, I cannot overstate the importance of that. Um, again, what, part of my task um, to Red Pete was to say, don't just come back and tell me that social media is important. We all know it is. Um, we need strategies around which we can actually um, use social media to create more commerce. I have an example in a minute. Um, but this was, you know, maybe an obvious point, but an incredibly important one in that essentially when you're looking at what the technology allows us to do in terms of getting our messages out, the importance of word of mouth is greater than it's ever been. And word of mouth means something very, very different in today's world. I think it's fair to say that the role of brand is every bit as important, in my opinion, more important than it's ever been. I think when I was rather flippantly saying at the beginning of, the, um, of my presentation that I've never really understood marketing. I've always tried to understand the job that I'm in, and I'm trying to understand the job that I'm in now. That's been a bit of an advantage to me as well as a major disadvantage. The big advantage is I've never really known what the boundaries are. And that was one of the reasons why the idea of brand valuation came out of my firm in the 80s was that well, we were going out of business, so we had to come up with something. And having had a legal and a financial background originally, I thought, well, let's figure out a way of putting a monetary value on it. And the, the system had its whatever issues it had, but it did change the conversation and in, increase the role of branding somewhat. I think as society develops, 
branding just gets more and more and more important because more people are talking about brands than ever before. And this sort of statistic just shows you, again, in a cluttered environment, just how important it is. And the fundamentals are exactly the same. It's just that the dissemination of messaging is so much different. So what does this mean? And how is it, what, what am I going to do about it? Um, and having admitted that I can't tell you everything, I can at least tell you something. So when it comes to the millennial generation, just don't, you know, dig deeper. I mean, at the end of the day, it's never, it's just not definable in a way. I mean, yes, we've defined it as a connected generation, but if you think about it, that can mean an, a, a lot of different things. So, I mean, this is one appalling example where, you know, the Applebee's, which some of you may know, if you know the US, is a very sort of Midwestern family values, uh, quite, you know, good restaurant chain, wanted to get a little bit more hip and just thought by extending the bar and, and uh, appealing to a different audience would suddenly be cool and it was anything but. And again, just sticking a skateboard and, you know, a few jazzy um, uh, graphics on the, on, on the side of a can isn't suddenly going to make it appeal to this very discerning generation. This is one I do want to stick on a little bit because it's unbelievably important and it's very, very important to Acer. Um, second insight is... Um, how about tapping into the connected generation's natural inclination to record their lives? It's a very, very important point because you, let's, with all this information that now exists on this generation and the, the, the wish of this generation to record practically everything that they do, whether, you know, through whatever channel they want to choose, let's get hold of the information in a positive way and help us to actually create things, whether it's products or services that they actually really want, as opposed to what we believe they want. This even sort of extends to things like games. And I think this, the next slide is a, is, a, is a piece of video from Puma, um, which I would sort of call the gamification of society, but it's quite interesting. Trying to tell you, y'all and looking kid, it's rebel. She said, I bow you over. He said, it's cool, now girl, we're over. Take it like a man, stand like a soldier. Boys, make noise, I'm taking over. I know you want it. idea from Puma, but the idea that it's given us is the idea, again, the idea of um, not, you know, that you could call that sort of flippant, but wh where I think it can be very interesting is if you can actually take the, the kernel of that idea and make sure that you understand what really matters to the people that are, that are using in the way you're building your community and finding a way to actually engage them in a, in a different way from actionable insight. The next insight was that ideas count for more than production quality. Um, I sort of half believe this. I mean, I, I, having been on the agency side much of my life, I've spent an awful lot of time persuading clients that production quality is terribly important, and it is. But at the end of the day, I think not everybody's got budgets, and you, ideas are going to drive it. Again, when you're dealing in an organization that you need to transform, but your budgets are not excessive, then a premium is essentially on the idea. This is a video which um, uh, I'm going to show which cost $500 and got, in the end, 
somewhere over two, two million hits. <laughs> The learning there was to actually engage people in a conversation that was beyond the, this particular um, piece of work, because clearly a lot of major cities around the world got very engaged in the conversation because it was a statement about how secure their environments were. So again, the idea was what parties can you bring into the conversation and how is it going to spread that particular way rather than looking at something on its, just on its own terms. Social media can power a brand alone. Exactly. Yes, it can. But again, my, my charge um, to the agency was, well, give me examples. And how can I actually change the way that we do commerce even on the back of, of a good job that we can do in social media? Uh, one, one example was this uh, idea with Starbucks and Twitter, and I think it's worth just spending a moment on it. Know someone who deserves a Starbucks coffee? Now it's as simple as sending a tweet. Introducing Starbucks Tweet of Coffee, a cool new way to give the treat of Starbucks. Tweet Starbucks to your yoga teacher, your dog walker, or someone you follow but have never met. Use it to celebrate and reward the big and small things. Once you've linked your accounts, all you have to do is tweet at Tweet of Coffee to your recipient's Twitter handle. You can even include a short note. They'll receive a tweet with a link to a $5 Starbucks card e-gift that they can redeem right off their phone at participating stores. It's a new way to say, you're awesome. The Starbucks is on me. To get started, go to starbucks.com forward slash tweet a coffee to connect your Starbucks and Twitter accounts. Then you're ready to go. Only from Starbucks and Twitter. Again, a very simple coupon idea, but a very personalized one. Um, the final one I'm going to show you, I have other ones, but I'm, I'm, I know I'm conscious of time. But this one just appeals to me because this was a very interesting insight. The gener this generation needs to appear interesting. And sometimes it's not necessarily the ad that you think that's actually going to really engage them. And I got the agency to show a whole number of different um, ads, some that you'd think were very, very on the money for this particular generation, and some that you would thought may not appeal. And the undisputed winner in this particular survey was this ad, um, which I happen to personally like, but it's also quite interesting because it's not necessarily the obvious choice. The police often question him just because they find him interesting. His beard alone has experienced more than a lesser man's entire body. His blood smells like cologne. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer Dos Equis. Stay thirsty, my friends. Well, again, I mean, it's in the same way that we've all known for years and years that showing humanity doesn't necessarily mean you have to show human beings. 
what may appeal to millennials isn't necessarily showing young people just having a good time. Sometimes it can be something slightly, slightly different. And another insight, every moment is an opportunity for self-expression. Um, that, again, is um, something that at ASA we are um, wanting to, to focus on. But I think it's, it comes down to, I think, the, the, the piece of this, which is what are we actually going to do with all of this? When I distill all of that information um, together, um, there's sort of four things. Um, in, re in transforming ASA from what it has been to what it needs to be, um, the idea of building an ecosystem, the idea of building an ecosystem, which isn't just about products, but about products and services, is, a, is fundamentally the only way we're going to be able to do it. We're going to be calling it BYOC, which is build your own cloud. But cloud is an issue in and of itself because it means so much or in some respects so little to people because it tends to mean just a way of storing information and accessing information. It needs to be an awful lot more than that. What it means for us is getting information um, in a good way. I'm not talking about sort of WikiLeaks or Snowden or anything, but get, getting information. The idea, you know, the gamification example I, I chose, but finding out insights on our community and providing the right products and services as a result of what they are telling us. And again, through the technology that we have and through the ability to, um, uh, to access it, that is absolutely possible. Um, the second part of what BYOC means is actually a different way of doing business. We've traditionally been very focused on um, uh, just selling um, products through channel. Um, that means something different today, both because the channel themselves have their own websites and, and interactive trade, but our need to develop our e-commerce is absolutely critical. So BYOC for us is going to mean a different way of actually doing business, whether it's through the social media idea that I showed with Twitter or whether it's actually something even more fundamental than that in terms of how we engage, how you actually pay for our products and services and what you get for it. Ideas driving communication. Um, again, that doesn't sound very new, but actually, um, I think it is new in a way. To me, when I talk about ideas in communication, I think a big, big difference I see from any other time that I've been a practitioner in this industry is that I think the greatest creativity is coming through the dissemination of the message rather than what you might call core creativity itself. So I think that understanding that and what we do with that is actually, again, going to be very much a fundal part of what we're building. And then, finally, enabling self-expression, creating an ecosystem which is actually going to facilitate the people to do the things that they really, really like doing, which is talking about themselves in a good way and documenting the way that they are. Um, but it is all driven by fundamentally an understanding of what it is that we're talking about here, which is this generation that is essentially going to be preeminent in everything that we do going forward.